This is a talk about the state of the real-time preemption project. So let me talk a little bit about the project itself. The mission of this project is RT mainlining in the very end. So it's all, but it's also about documentation, establishing community, long-term maintenance, testing, and things like that. So one of the questions I get regularly asked is why establishing community is important. So when I was talking to Linus a couple of years ago about the chance to get preempt RT into the main line, he said to me very clearly, if there's not enough backing behind that project, he's not going to take it. There's a very simple reason for that, because he can take random drivers, random file systems, whatever. They can bit rot away in the kernel forever and eventually get removed. But RT is a different beast. It gets into the guts of the core kernel. It fiddles around there. And it might, to some degree, impose some limitations on the freedom to develop the kernel further. So at least not in the way they do it now, because they have to respect that RT is there and think about the problems, how to solve it with RT. Um, so that's what we are doing after the fact right now, which is a painful whack the mole game. So um, funding, uh, we have these members uh, paying funds into the project. Uh, we have that for 27. So out of these funds, we can have five developers working on the project. So they are working on the code. They are working on the testing infrastructure, on documentation, and all the related things. So that's pretty good. Uh, I'm happy this happened. Uh, it's much more fun to get paid for things. So um, let's a little bit talk about the tasks we accomplished since the project started in 2016. So that's 21 months from now, uh, from now, behind now, or oh, whatever. Uh, so one of the, the two things we were really, really busy with, and it took us a lot of time, was the hot plug lock, uh, the hot plug CPU hot plug rework, and the CPU hot plug locking rework. Um, why would we actually tackle that? So one of the things was that the complete CPU hot plug infrastructure in the kernel was known to be fragile for about 10, 15, or longer years, <laughs> ever since, since it got there. And it really was duct tape, literally duct taped to death. So people just applied workarounds over workarounds and some other workarounds. And all this stuff completely fell apart when you tried to do CPU hot plug with preempt RT. Not fun, because people want to run RT for whatever reasons on their laptop and expect suspend resume to work, be working. Or uh, there's actual uh, useful use cases. You have battery operated uh, devices for data acquisition which require an RT kernel and you want to suspend them in, in order to save power. Uh, so you really want to have that support. Uh, I had a first step at uh, rewriting the CPU hot plug infrastructure which was basically based on notifiers. And the notifier chains have interesting uh, properties. So they are randomly ordered, uh, despite the fact that they, you can assign uh, notifier priorities. But we had notifier priorities, 10 of them documented in a header file that were actually defines for them. And then we had about 20 others, which were randomly chosen numbers hard-coded in the particular uh, code file, which is very easy to understand and to debug. The other thing about notifiers was uh, what was interesting in the hot plug case 
Um, you would expect if you bring up something like a CPU and you initialize all the facilities and all the drivers and whatever it, need, it needs it, need the hot plug information that the new CPU is there, and then you pull the CPU out, you would expect that you tear down the crap in the reverse order you brought it up. No, notifiers get called in the same order. So we had situations where we had uh, code where we had two notifiers because it was asymmetric and they required symmetry. Another code which would have required symmetry as well just worked around it by hacking really crappy stuff into the code to, to make it work. Uh, <clears throat> in 2012, I, I really got tired of fixing or trying to fix uh, hot plug in RT. And I posted a first patch set uh, which introduced a state machine. State machine with explicit states where we have documented ordering and the states that was the, the assumption in that, uh, at that point, the states have to be symmetrical. So I ran out of spare time um, and some big corporation promised to pick it up when we had a big discussion about CPU hot plug at a conference. Um, what happened was they went away, didn't do anything about it, and applied some more duct tape to the hot plug code, which was pretty much fun. So uh, end of 2015, we started to look into that again when we knew that the RT funding was in place and it's finished roughly now. So we still have to fix that. But, but this is not a new one. <laughs> but this was an easy one. So there was a lot of groundwork to do to get there. Um, first of all was look at all the places, and that's hundreds, in the kernel which use CPU hot plug notifiers and stare at the code and uh, sometimes you need special classes to do that. So. Um, analyze it, document the ordering requirements which have been interesting because you have the explicit ordering, the explicit ordering by priorities but that was only 10% of the total notifier base and the rest was ordered by chance, um, either by uh, link time ordering or uh, by just runtime ordering that uh, uh, particular init calls happened in a, in a certain order, which was mostly due to link time ordering again. Uh, this was interesting because when we converted that uh, to the state machine, we didn't know because you, we were too lazy to figure really out in which order they were coming. So we just assumed ordering, which broke stuff. So, which means this code worked by chance, not by design. Uh, while we were analyzing all that stuff, we, we found really several dozens of bugs in the CPU hot plug notifiers in the callbacks, or just bogus code in there. Either never executed or not, ex not exploding for whatever reason. Uh, after that, we had, uh, I revived the, the old state machine core patches and rewrote them mostly. But then we did a one by one conversion of the notifiers to states. So this was a lot of analysis not necessary because uh, we tried to not only to do a one-to-one -one conversion, we also tried to do a symmetrical conversion so that we can really get into that state where we have the ordering build up stuff in that direction and tear it down in the same order or in, or in the reverse order. And that involved the gradual removal of the old infrastructure. Uh, once we had this finished, uh, we went to the next interesting problem, which 
uh, caused us a lot of uh, headache in our team. And it was the hot plug locking. The hot plug lock was basically uh, a kind of a lock. It was a counting semaphore, uh, not really covered by any of the lock debugging mechanisms, or only basically covered. It evaded locked up uh, on a, almost completely. So what we did, we ripped that um, homebrew counting mutex out of the code base and replaced it with the pure CPU reader writer semaphore for scalability. That was something people wanted to have anyway because uh, the, the mutex counter-based uh, CPU hot plug clocking was not scalable at all, and a lot of code uh, actually uses it in, in hot paths, so you get contention under certain workloads. So I tried to do that in 14 or something like that, and then Linux. Yeah. So yeah, every worked on hot plug lock for the first period of the for the 14 or something, and then Linux told me that no hot path should rely on this, and please go away. Um, so yeah, it's good that we now find it right anyway. Yeah, but but uh, but Linus, yeah, I remember that discussion, and Linus said no hot plug uses it, uh, no hot path uses it, or should use it. But he couldn't, but he couldn't prevent that hot plug uh, that it's used in hot paths. So he made me take it out of the scheduler hot path, and I succeeded in that um, by adding a more RC hot path abuse. Right. <laughs> I know, but, but uh, he didn't argue with me when I changed it, uh, fortunately. Um, because what I could show him, uh, one of the reasons he didn't argue, I think, was that I could show him that now that uh, the locking was under, um, under locked up coverage, we actually could prove that there are tons of uh, deadlocks hidden in the code. And it was an amazing amount. Some of them took literally weeks to solve. Because cross Yeah. So so we had we had this interaction between tracing, proof, K probes, the chump label code, which all took random in random places the CPU out block lock. Because nobody noticed that there might be a problem because locked up didn't complain, so it must be fine. Uh, we have to, uh, Peter just mentioned, we have a similar discussion right now on LKML about the cross-release um, uh, locked up feature, where we, where, you, where we want to track dependencies which come from a task waiting for something and the other task releasing it, which is completions or wait queues, where we can have interesting uh, deadlocks. Task A is waiting for completion B, and task B is waiting for completion A. Not covered, but you can have the same thing with lock. Task A takes lock and then waits on completion. Task B takes lock and wants to complete. Doesn't work. So this kind of things and other more complex uh, scenarios. And people are now complaining, Oh, we don't want to deal with that. There are too many false positives. And I had a nasty discussion with one of the SCSI developers in the last couple of days where I told him, well, uh, we had the same problem with LockDAP when we introduced LockDAP. The first years of LockDAP were just annotating code and teaching LockDAP about false positives. Because he was falsely claiming that LockDAP is perfect and does never see false positives. I mean... You should talk to Dave Chinner. Pardon? You should talk to Dave Chinner. <laughs> I, I did some statistics, actually. Um, we have about 1,000 places, 1,000, literally 1,000 places in the kernel uh, where we do locked up annotations. Oh, I spent a good year doing locked up annotations when I started at Red Hat. Pardon? I, I did a good year of locked up annotations when I started at Red Hat. This is how I got sucked into all this. Yeah. So, no, the, 
that was a pretty interesting work uh, to cure these locked app problems in, 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 the, in the code, especially the, the convoluted tracing proof, K probes, jump label thingy that was going around in circles. Thanks, you. Thanks, Watchdog. Stephen. Yeah, that was another story. Um, we are mostly done with curing it. The lost fallout was uh, the watchdog uh, thing. I, for some stupid reason, I didn't trigger it in testing. And it got reported, and I looked at it and said, oh, that should be easy. Uh, 40 patches later, it was fixed. Because it turned out the code was so buggy. And they tried to work around the, the CPU hot plug problems uh, by papering over a design problem in the underlying code base. And this simply didn't work. And um, yeah, that was uh, another two weeks wasted. So there are a couple of lessons learned. If you unearth existing bugs, you are expected to fix them. Nobody cares. So there's, I literally got told this bug was not bef there before you changed the hot plug lock. OK, I, I could prove the person that it was there. It was just not expressed by locked up. But it was clear, no, I don't. I have no, uh, no interest to fix that. OK, you go and fix it yourself. The amount of crap you find is insane. I mean, a lot of people talk about the code quality of the kernel. Yes, it has a lot of code quality in certain places. But don't look aside of those certain places. It's amazing. But it's a lot of fun to, to see that, to fix it up, to clean it up. and. If you think you saw the worst thing already, no, it's going to become worse. So if you really want to, to help with such work and Julia is doing uh, things like that, um, Keith, Keith Cook is doing it for a different reason, for security, he, he re, uh, rewrites the, the timer wheel uh, API. Uh, so he ends up touching thousands of files and if you want to do that or ever get into the situation that you need to do a big tree-wide cleanup, don't worry. Don't give up. Just do it. Pun? Huh? Ref count. <laughs> Ref count. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Never, and the other lesson learned was never expect that corporates keep their promises. That's, yeah. I was young back then. I was not a grandpa. So that's an excuse. So, but the other thing I learned about that, that estimation of effort is extremely hard. Uh, when we started the RT project and got funding, of course, we had to, to come up with a timeline or a project plan and things like that. So I took out a crystal ball and estimated it. Uh, no, the, seriously, the estimation was based on a lot of knowledge. I was doing this stuff for years. So I thought I could estimate it pretty good. But particularly for the hot plug stuff, I was off by a factor of two and the total work hours by a factor of three, which is, in terms of software projects, not that bad. But I would have expected to be to be better. But yeah. So it took two years of time, in to almost two years of time in total, to clean that up. Something like two man, man years effort. And the resulting patch flow out of that was something like 1.2 patches per workday. So you can extrapolate how many patches that took uh, to get this cleaned up. So other stuff we were doing during that time frame, uh, we rewrote the internals of the timer wheel, because the timer wheel had a big problem in RT. Um, we couldn't make the timer wheel base lock a raw spin lock. And actually, I had to convert it to a sleeping spin lock due to the cascading nature of the timer wheel. 
Um, and I wanted to get rid of that. Um, that was done by uh, losing the precision of the timer wheel for timers which are fought out in expiry time. Um, but that allowed us to uh, get no hertz and the no hertz full stuff working on RT again because there's a code path where we have to take that lock from idle and we can't take sleeping spin locks from idle. That simply doesn't work. Uh, we tried it. It didn't simply work. Uh, you can, but it, it's not recommended. Um, HR Timers has a patch that posted. It was, in a, was reviewed. It's uh, uh, about to repost it again. Uh, it's about the distinction between timers which expire in hard interrupt context and timers which expire in soft interrupt context. So in, in the initial version in mainline, we had this distinction, but then at some point, Linus looked at the code and yelled at us, rightfully so. It was ugly. Um, and uh, we ripped it out, and for those users who needed the, the soft IRQ expiry, we came up with a weird construct, uh, HR timer tasklet, which basically scheduled from the hard interrupt context callback the tasklet, which then executed in soft IRQ context the actual callback of the, of the driver. Pun? You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I don't tell anyone who came up with that. Um, so, there's quite some uses of that in, in Tree, and we had other discussions that some of the uh, some of facilities wanted to use HR timers for uh, good reasons, uh, but they needed the same indirection, which is inefficient and ugly. So, and RT needs it as well because most of the timers which are can be executed in hard, or the callback can be executed in hard IRQ context on the main line, cannot be uh, run in hard IRQ context on RT. So we have that workaround uh, for moving the timers to a separate expiration queue uh, from hard interrupt context still in RT, but it's still inefficient, it's still ugly, and uh, we rewrote it so it's uh, pretty, it looks pretty sane right now. So basically what we do, we have the, the, the high resolution timers are queued in uh, RB trees, uh, sorted by expiry time for the various clock, different clocks we have in the system, clock monotonic, clock real time, clock boot time, and clock tie. And so what we do, we duplicate the, the basis and then we have for each uh, clock base, we have a corresponding soft expiry clock base. So we don't have to reshuffle expiring timers from the, from the, uh, high risk, uh, from the hard interrupt context into a separate expiry queue. We just queue them right away in, in their own RB tree and just say, oh, this is the first timer of this set and please make sure that uh, the hard timer fires at that time. Works, removes quite some crap from, from, from the RT patch again. Uh, we did a quite some work in the areas of Futex and RT Mutex together with Peter and others. This was fun. Uh, separation of page fault and preemption, we had it for a long time in RT, then the S390 people uh, figured out that they needed it for mainline. Uh, I think it was for virtualization uh, purposes. Um, and so we helped them along to get that done. Um, then the, there was a huge amount of code in the, in the, in the tree, which was app using task affinities for obscure purposes. 
And we extended a lot of the debug facilities in, in order to, to catch uh, abuse of various things in the kernel. So by now we have, since then, it, in this one and uh, three quarters of years, we have um, about 700 patches merged either uh, or they in Linux 3 or they are on the way for 4.15 uh, uh, in one of the uh, maintainer trees. There's uh, roughly 50 patches uh, under review or pending for repost out there. And in summary, we fixed about 40 real and 80 latent bugs in that time. And it was Fortunately, very obscure stuff. The latent ones, I, I categorize them into they're basically impossible to trigger, but they exist. Uh, the 40 real ones were, were actually rather easy to, to trigger, but uh, people got lucky and never tri triggered them, or they got never reported. Now, we, had a, uh, we had a lot of bugs. Uh, have a lot of bugs seen also with the with the early work in RT where we uh, spent a huge amount of time of fixing up lock problems, um, where then people told, oh yes, that's the thing which stops my server every three months. Yeah. So uh, Let's talk a little bit about the long-term stable versions because that's something uh, which came, comes up regularly and came up recently in a discussion. So these are the trees we are currently having. Uh, for 14 will be the next one. I don't know what the end of life is for that one yet. Pardon? Long-term stable. 413 is not a long-term stable. 414 is the long-term stable. Four foot, four, yeah. So Stephen is doing a lot of the work, but Stephen doesn't scale, so we have to have a discussion in the, in the meeting on Monday. So Julia great, uh, took over full one, right? Um, so, but still there's uh, stuff which is really updated, and Stephen has a huge backlog, I, he told me. So we have to do something about that, but that's a discussion we have on Monday in the project meeting. Uh, our current development version is 413. The patch is out there, it kind of works. So, but we are not going to stabilize it. We are going to drop it uh, in favor of 414 because that's going to be a long-term stable version and we agreed on supporting long-term stables instead of picking a randomly chosen kernel version. Uh, whatever. You know I'm stubborn. So what do we have on, uh, on development tasks? The most complex one right now is decache locking. Um, that's uh, the software interrupt modifications. There are still some rough edges there which we have to figure out. Memory management interaction. That's pretty straightforward, but uh, memory manage, uh, management uh, maintainers are interesting people. Uh, and the local logs and annotations, that's something I wanted to, to get into mainline for a long time, but uh, got distracted by hot block logs and other. Two? Yeah, I talked about uh, about that with him, uh, and he didn't come up with something reasonable. But then he didn't care much because it works in mainline, by some definition of works. So what's wrong with the decache locking? Uh, decache locking um, has one problem which uh, hits us in RT. It's doing trilock loops. So, because in the decache you have to take locks in reverse order uh, if you walk a tree in a particular direction. And in order to achieve that, you lock the, the top node and then you try to lock the parent node or is it the other way around? I don't know what the regular 
log order is. I always keeps forgetting it. So the regular order, let's say, goes up, and then if we go down, you have to do the, the trilog dance. So trilogging in mainline is pretty cheap because you know that the other side is, is in the critical section and it's going to, to, to leave it sooner than later. So now that doesn't work on RT, especially not if the one who holds the lock is on the same CPU and you preempted it, and it cannot get back on the CPU because you preempted it, so you would try lock forever. And you get unbound uh, priority inversions by that, up to the point of a life lock. So uh, right now we have a but ugly workaround in there. We just go and say, if we fail to try lock, we just go to sleep. Uh, for uh, I think a couple of microse uh, 100 microseconds or something like that. I don't, I can't remember. Or it's a millisecond. I, it doesn't matter much. I mean, it's it. So the, the reason why why I did this was a. It was the cheapest solution for the problem. B. Uh, I was just saying if any real time relevant task is doing file system operations on the D cache. I can help them anyway, so screw it. You always have my one solution for the uh, try locker boost. <laughs> it worked. I know it worked, Stephen, but it's even more convoluted than the multi reader boosting. Well, at least it's more deterministic. It's deterministically ugly, it's just not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's some deterministic behavior in ugliness when patches come from you in that area. We know that. Now, uh, seriously, but I was talking to a couple of people involved uh, in the Dcache uh, itself, and uh, some of them actually think that we, the, the trilog loops are not needed at all. So there, ne uh, there is some and I know that there is some uh, experimentation out there already, and uh, some of them, uh, some of that was was initiated by me, um, uh, trying to do more RCU stuff in Dcache, and it kind of works, but there are a couple of corner cases which really do not work, and we have no idea yet how to solve that. And uh, unfortunately, Nick Piggin. Uh, I mean, he's back in kernel development, but he vanished for a couple of years in some dark, hidey place. Uh, but he's, it seems he forgot everything about the cache he wrote ever. Wouldn't you? Pardon? Wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I probably would have forgotten it by now as well. So this is the most challenging issue right now. If you have an idea how to solve that, you're which is not involving trilog boosting, <laughs> which is something we can actually sell to Linus. Uh, yeah, that would be appreciated. At the moment, I draw a blank, but that has been the case for several times, and we always came up with some solution for, for the problems. So let's see where that goes. So if you want to help, uh, there's Testing documentation, that's stuff we really need help on. Uh, if you really want to dive into the code, there's a task list on the real-time wiki. It's halfway up to date. I updated it two weeks ago. Yeah, I did my homework. Um, so, but uh, if you have something particular in mind, please shoot me an email and let's talk about it. Other than that, just grab the code, fix it, and send me the patch and say it's done. I'm happy to, pu to, to pull it in. So people expect, always expect the roadmap from my talks. Here is the roadmap. This time, due to the evolutionary nature of Linux, the roadmap will be published after the fact, but it will be a very, very precise roadmap. Questions? Nope. No, and I gave up on that. You're all 
you all have these smartphones now and can figure out where the pup is on your own. So that the, the roadmap with the pup was back then at a time when most people didn't have these things. So. so no more questions. That's good. Everybody wants, looks forward to the next speaker, which is Stephen Rostad and his 500 words per minute talk with 6,000 slides in a half an hour. 